Yes. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the Kinabatangan Honda project is based in Sabah. So for those who don't know, that's the location. So let's go to the next slide where we zoom into Kinabatangan. So you can see that the landscape is uh, quite a degraded area. It's surrounded by all these oil palm plantations. And it's a very fragmented forest. You have patches of uh, virgin forest, secondary forest. Uh, but, so next. But despite this, the forest that remains is very beautiful and it's actually home to eight species of hondels in Borneo. Next. So what's so uh, interesting about hornbills? Hornbills are cavity nesting birds, meaning they have to find trees that have cavities in them. They cannot make these cavities, even with their big bill and their big cast, they can't excavate these cavities. And these cavities are usually formed in dipterocarp trees. And it starts out maybe by a woodpecker making a hole or maybe a sun bear was looking for termites, it digs up a hole in the tree and then the tree heals itself and creates a nice cavity for the hornbill to use. So you can imagine that this process takes years to happen and it also happens in very old growth trees. And um, as I mentioned before, there are eight species of hornbills in Borneo, but there are 10 species of hornbills in Peninsular Malaysia. And a lot of people think that toucans and hondels are the same. They're actually very different from different families. And hondels are actually from the family Busirotidae. So I want to uh, shift your attention to this picture here. Um, this is a rhinoceros hondel, a male hondel. And you can tell simply by looking at the eyes, the eye color. And can you imagine there's a female of the same size inside this cavity? She sealed herself inside. And if you look at the darker area at the entrance, that is the sealing material that they added. So the sealing material can be, you know, their feces mixed with fruits. And the very interesting thing about hornbills is they add exoskeleton. So the outer shell of centipedes and millipedes, they mesh it together to create this really hard sealing material. So it protects, you know, like snakes to come in, you know, it's, uh, it's basically a defense uh, mechanism. It also might have something to do with the regulation of the uh, climate inside, the microclimate inside the cavity, the temperature and the humidity. So hunters are pretty interesting, they're like engineers. Next slide. You can go next. Yeah, hold on. It's hang. Uh-oh. <laughs> Too heavy, yeah, Paris. So Gaia is basically uh, comprises of myself, Ravinder Kaur. I'm the scientific director of Gaia. It's a social enterprise, as Buti uh, mentioned. We're very young, uh, probably about five to six years old only. Uh, next slide. And I founded Gaia with uh, Sanjit Pal Singh. He does all the visual, the art uh, part of the project, uh, especially environmental education aspects. Uh, we have several drone pilots uh, in Kinabatangan and Sanjit is one of them. So the drone helps us peek into the uh, cavities of hornbills or to take pictures of them, because all these cavities happen really high in the trees, uh, about 20 meters above. So these drones are really useful for our project. Next. Next slide, all right. So of course, um, this project cannot take place without local support. Um, we have local villages uh, that are working on the project, especially Helsen Hassan and Amidi. Um, Helsen is a carpenter who's built boats by his hand with his dad. So he, we go to him um, to help us with the artificial nest box building. 
Um, Amidi is also amazing in the forest. He's very brave in the forest. Though he's the youngest in our team. And they help also do scientific uh, data collection in the forest. Next slide. And I want to, I love this picture because it shows how many people are involved in a conservation project. That's why actually I feel a bit uncomfortable with the term hero. You know, they call a wildlife hero. There's actually so many people involved in a conservation project. And you can see here the local people, the Orang Kampong. And then we have here zookeepers um, from international zoos coming together. Everyone putting their, they are bringing all their skills together. The professional climbers are all the local people. You know, this is their backyard, is their forest. So they know the area best. But we don't work so closely with the birds. So we rely on zookeepers uh, from overseas that have worked with these birds to give us advice on how to, you know, make better artificial nest boxes, for example. So it takes a big team to do a lot of work uh, for the hunters. Next. So here's a, a picture, an example of what we do every March, every year. We, we host international zoos that come down. Um, and we try to come up with better artificial nest boxes. And I'll talk about artificial nest boxes later. And the reason why we're building artificial nest boxes is, like I mentioned, uh, hornbills, they need natural cavities to nest in. But these trees are also usually timber trees. So they have been logged. Most of them have been lost through logging activities. So hunters are losing places to nest in. So we're always trying to make nesting opportunities for the hornbills. And we do this two ways. One, by the introduction of artificial nest boxes. And secondly, by restoring tree cavities, which I will talk about more later. Next. And it's amazing to see how the Orang Kampung is so dedicated uh, in this project. If you go to the next slide. Next slide. You can see, oh, back. Yeah, you can see here in this picture how everyone is so in tune. The Orang Kampung is just in tune to, you know, in doing this uh, project and everyone is so dedicated in this work. Um, these guys actually grew up seeing the effect of deforestation. You know, they've seen the logging activities take place in Kinabatangan. And I, I've never seen so much commitment by local people before. And I've worked in several areas uh, in Peninsula and in Borneo. So Orang Sukau are really, I would say, really con conservation uh, savvy. Okay, next. So let's talk about hornbills. Um, this is the reed hornbill. It travels in large flocks. Um, it's also known as Ngang Buno because it likes high elevation areas. Okay, let's go to the next hornbill. This is the rhinoceros hornbill. And like I mentioned before, um, you can tell it's, whether it's female or male by the eye. So this is the female hornbill. Okay, next. And I love this picture because it's kind of silly. Where is its body and its tail? So this is a great hornbill. Uh, it's enjoying its uh, ficus tree. And I think this is photographed in Langkawi. Okay. And this is uh, oriental pied hornbill. This is a pair. You can see that the female is, is smaller than the male and her cask is not as defined as the male hornbill. And the oriental pied hornbill is uh, very common in Kinabatangan and very resilient. And we think it's because it's got a very uh, diverse uh, food uh, preference. Next. Can you spot the hornbill? So this is a white crown hornbill. And I think it's one of the coolest hornbills because it's carnivorous. And um, it actually hangs out a lot in the oil palm plantation, picking um, insects and all that. It might actually be helping to regulate the pest in the, in the uh, plantations. And what's also unique about this bird is in 1982, LinkedIn mentioned that this bird is actually preying on young chicks. 
young swiftlet uh, uh, chicks in the caves. So it's a very interesting uh, hornbill. Because the other hornbills are more uh, fully worries. This hornbill, when I was uh, doing my work in Bulam Temenggo, uh, I was working with Malaysian Nature Society. That was my first job, actually. And when I was on the hornbill project, I really wanted to see this hornbill. This is a wrinkle hornbill. But it was so hard to spot them in uh, Peninsula Malaysia. But in Kinabatangan, they are very common. And you see large flocks of them uh, from time to time. A very colorful hornbill. Next. This one I call the rock star of the hornbill group because you know it has a very coarse uh, voice. Um, also fairly common in the Kinabatangan, usually we see it on the edges, but we've yet to find a, a nest of this hornbill. And these are bushy crested hornbills, uh, very adorably lining up uh, to prepare to roost for the night, that means to go to sleep at night. Um, they probably do this because they want to regulate their body temperature. Uh, but do you notice that they pick the thinnest branch to roost on? Why did they do that? So basically, when you roost on a very thin branch, if there's a snake or a predator coming towards you, the branch will move, right? So it'll wake you up. It's an alarm. So they are very, very smart uh, birds. Next. And this is, of course, the star of the show, our very own critically endangered helmeted hornbill. Uh, we've spent a lot of time watching this hornbill in the wild, and we find that it usually likes to catch stick insects. It can catch up to three stick insects in about eight hours in a day. So I don't know what's the reason for this, uh, but we suspect it's because they, they exist in the same area in the canopy, higher up in the canopy. Uh, there might be some nutritional value to uh, uh, consuming uh, stick insects. Uh, I, I understand there is some me medicinal value for stick insects for human beings. So if anyone has any experience with stick insects or want to talk to me more about this, I would love to speak about this. And this one bill is also strange in a sense that it loves to eat figs. And I've, you know, I've spent a lot of time collecting um, uh, all its feces and all that and I only see a lot of fig seeds, hardly any other seeds. So it, it's a 90% fig eater. And that's also what has been shown by other studies in Indonesia and in Thailand as well. Yeah, stick bug. I see a comment there. This is a very uh, interesting picture taken in the wild. I don't think anyone has gotten such a photograph of a wild helmeted hornbill using its green oil gland that is located near the tail um, to apply on its body. This yellowish oil is simply for cosmetic purposes, but it also might have some antibacterial uh, properties in it. So you can see the tinges of yellow on the hondo. Pretty fascinating that the hondo has this green oil gland. Next. So as I mentioned earlier, hondos are cavity nesting birds. So imagine already the forest is degraded, they don't have a place to nest in because the big trees are gone and they cannot make these cavities themselves. And when they do find a cavity, like for example in this picture here, there's a, in the before picture, there's an oriental pied hornbill, a female inside nesting. So this is a suitable cavity and then a year later it was taken over by wasps. So this is not the only uh, animal, I mean insect out there that will take over the cavity. There are other animals as well, such as the, you know, the giant flying squirrel, civets. So there are other cavity nesting birds, also, I mean, other cavity nesting animals that are also looking for suitable cavities to use. Yeah, even yeah, ants as well. But no, this, these are not ants. This was actually wasps. So we are always trying to create nesting opportunities for hornbills. And one of our methods is to restore cavities. So we look for trees that have cavities. And this is an example of the tree that had a cavity, but it was not a nest of a hornbill. So here is Halsen Hassan. What he has done is he, he checked the inside of the, the floor of the cavity, and it was more than a meter. Uh, it had collapsed inside. 
So he added soil to remedy it and he made the top part, the roof of it, more higher. We call it the fang hole. Actually, that top part is very important for the hornbills because the hornbill actually goes upwards if it's threatened by predators. It's like a hiding spot. Also, the high ceiling helps uh, in regulation of temperature and humidity for the hornbills. Um, um, no, wait, go back to that slide, yeah? Um, yeah, so this method has been is being practiced by the Thailand Hornbill Project and they are very successful. And when we tried this on this tree, within, I mean, after a month, we had an oriental pipe use the tree. And you can see on the left-hand side of the tree, there's this gray object. I don't know if Ruti can, ah, okay, you can point it out. That's actually a data logger. So it's recording temperature and humidity outside the cavity. And we have one more inside the natural cavity. Because we wanted to understand this temperature and humidity uh, fluctuations to make better artificial nest boxes. Next. So this place is in Labo Bay. And they, are, they actually have a nesting oriental pipe nest. And um, of recently, they realized that the hornbill stopped nesting. So we asked them for permission to go and check this cavity and you can see the picture on the right hand side. Eddie is actually, he, can't, he tried to put his fist through the cavity and he couldn't. So it had narrowed over time. And this is a natural thing that happens with uh, tree, tree cavities. They can actually close over time naturally. So he used a chisel, he enlarged it and within a few months, the bird came back to nest. So we've done this with six different trees and we had four, four successful restoration work done. And it led to nine uh, oriental pipe chicks sledging from these cavities. So small effort can go a long way. So one of the things that we're always doing in the project is we're always looking for natural nests. So next either on the ground or from the boat. We are always looking for trees with cavities. And once we know that tree has a cavity, we will take down the GPS location and we will visit it from time to time because you never know if it's empty today, it might be occupied uh, during the breeding season. So part of my PhD work was this, uh, look, always looking for trees with cavities, we try to map out the resources. We find these are the most important resources for the hornbills, fig trees and trees with cavities. So once we know these cavities, we can monitor them, you know, long-term monitoring, we can go back to these trees. And in fact, we actually visited five of these trees this year, and we've restored five of these trees to make them hornbill suitable. Okay, next. The ones are getting so I have a strange uh, fascination with poop. Probably that's why I don't have many friends. So this is actually the base of a hornbill nest tree. So that's me, you know, dissecting the poop. We collect the poop and then we, next slide. We actually have to separate them. Separate them, uh, fruits one side, insects one side. You know, the amazing thing about the hornbills is uh, they regurgitate seeds undamaged and it falls under the tree. Okay, next slide. And this is so fascinating. This is under uh, oriental pipe uh, nest tree. You can see its diet is so, there's so many insect, insect wings, beetle wings. Um, so yeah, I have a feeling they're actually helping um, take care of the pest population in all the oil palm plantations nearby. So you can see um, all the beetles, for some strange reason, they don't consume the head. Like as if like us, when we eat prawn, we'll throw away the head. So they also don't really eat them. If you look at the top left hand side, it's all the heads of the beetles. And at the bottom bottom side, you can see a few of the beetles that sadly died in vain. They are still, <laughs> they didn't get consumed. Okay, next. So what is so important? Why is it so important to conserve hornbills? Why do we need them? 
So if you look at the base of the tree, you find all the seeds, the base of the nest tree. You find all the seeds uh, and they're all germinating, they're all growing. Um, either they pass through regurgitation from above or they come pass through the body and come out through the poop. And hondas, they cover vast areas. They're flying very far. And when they rest, they're regurgitating the seeds and they're planting seeds all over the forest. So they are our nature's gardener. And we all know that we need trees, right? We need forests because we can get clean air, clean water. It helps to regulate the temperature. So hondas are actually doing us a big ecological service. So we should work hard to help the hondas. So a lot of the seeds that fall under the nest tree, um, it will actually, many of them will die because it's too, too many aggregated in one area. So what we do is we collect the seeds and we actually started this last year. We collected over a thousand seeds, uh, but when we planted it, only 270 survived. So we work very closely with Bhutan, uh, the NGO that does a lot of re reforestation work. They have a team dedicated to reforestation work in Kinabatangan. So they actually try to connect uh, fragments of forest, build wildlife corridors. So we try to work with them to replant this uh, hunger preferred food plants. And it's also good for primates because what hundles consume, usually primates also consume. So it's good. Uh, good to have these trees for the forest. So we're going to watch two videos of nesting wonders now. Um, it's only 30 seconds, so it's very short. You want to talk about that video or continue? Yeah, so did you see, did you manage to get, uh, see the insect? It's a cicada, right? Yes, so we saw that. Yeah. So it was very interesting that at nine o'clock in the morning when the cicada started to sing, the diet became very uh, full of cicadas. So it was actually relying on the calling cicadas to catch them. Okay, let's see the reed hornbill now. So uh, previ the previous, uh, let's go back to the video for a minute. Uh, yeah. So if you see the, the gala pouch, where it stores, it's, it actually can store uh, fruits in this gala pouch. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the male hunger. Yeah. Some, uh, some of the scientists believe that that corrugation on the bill, those lines can actually age this bird. So that's because they see uh, the ones with ha uh, more lines on the on the path, like more seniority when they are on at the fig tree, they will chase off the ones with lesser lines. So maybe it's a mark of age, lah, those lines. Okay. Okay, next line. Okay, so way before Gaia came into uh, Kinabatangan, way before I went to do my PhD there, uh, Hutan had already set up five artificial nest boxes with Buval Zoo and Chester Zoo. So they put up these five boxes in 2013, I think, 2014, somewhere there. And uh, in 2017, the boxes started to become active. But before that, they had uh, Oriental Pied Hundu using it. But we all know that Oriental Pied are much more resilient. They are, they're not very picky when it comes to artificial nest boxes. Uh, but when the rhinoceros wonders started to use these boxes, it was quite amazing. Uh, and in fact, 
to date, there were five rhinoceros hornbill chicks that fledged from boxes. So we have five box babies in Kinabatangan. Uh, recently, we also had uh, bushy crested hornbills use these boxes. Okay, next. So this was actually big news because uh, rhinoceros hornbills have not been reported to use artificial nest boxes in the wild. So it actually was featured uh, in the BirdLife International article. And it was called actually the world's first. So why, why do hornbills you know, nest in living trees, living cavities? So a lot of uh, hornbill research has been conducted by the Thailand Hornbill Project. They've got 30 to 40 years worth of work. And uh, Dr. Pilai, I mean, Professor Pilai Ponswat uh, mentioned that the internal temperature inside the cavity is very steady, perhaps because of the xylem tissues. The xylem tissues draw water from the root up to the plant, to the leaves. So this movement of water actually helps regulate the temperature, internal temperature and humidity of a tree cavity. So here is an example of a data logger that I put inside a natural tree cavity. And you can see uh, um, afternoon is a blue line. It didn't matter if it was in the middle of the afternoon in Malaysia, it gets very hot, right? But the temperature was very low. And also, right early in the morning, it was the same. The temperature was about the same in the same area. So tree cavities, natural tree cavities, help to protect uh, the temperature and humidity, the, you know, against ambient temperature and humidity. So if you go to the next slide, this is the temperature in, in the temperature within uh, artificial nest box. And you can see the fluctuations is so big. So if you look at the top line, the blue line, in the middle of the afternoon, the temperature within the box is almost like the ambient temperature, the outside temperature. So we have a long way to go with artificial nest boxes. If we want them to work like a natural cavity, we have to address this issue. We have to make the, the fluctuation smaller like this, yeah, like the, the previous uh, graph. So that was part of my PhD work, to develop uh, artificial nest boxes with uh, the zookeepers and the orang kampung. Okay, next. So we came up with this box and uh, it was like 80 to 100 kilos and it literally took a village to put it up and uh, we also don't want to get hornbills that are common like the oriental pipe hornbills you know using these boxes so we have to put them inside the forest we can't put them at the forest edges so you know we have to um, carry these boxes uh, at least 200 meters into the forest and oh yes, I want to mention, uh, I should go back to that slide. This picture also shows how difficult it is to replace one cavity. So actually, it is best to preserve the forest where we can. We should extend our protected areas. It's very hard to try to uh, replace natural cavities. And even these boxes that we put up, some, some are used, some are not. So it's... Nothing beats the natural processes that are in the forest. So next. And then once we move these boxes 200 meters into the forest, it has to go up the tree at least 20 meters high. And um, if you put them lower, you tend to get smaller bodied hornbills interested in these boxes. So like the uh, rhinoceros hornbill that was nesting earlier, that box is at least 20 meters high. So larger hornbills prefer to nest higher areas. Uh, we found uh, a nest up to 37 meters high. So that's, that's what they like. Huh? They prefer that kind of uh, um, height. And uh, imagine after all the effort of putting the artificial nest boxes, um, all the money you spend, the time and everything, and then you see something else using your artificial nest boxes. So if you see inside the next slide, is a picture from the top. So I thought, what is this alien creature living in the box? So apparently it's a stingless bees. And uh, I was very sad when I saw this, I was like, hey, oh, no, all that effort, <laughs> and we have stingless bees. <laughs> we can start a factory. 
But then I read this paper um, that said that stingless bees uh, prefer to build their colonies in natural tree cavities of living trees. I was like, oh, so that means our boxes are functioning like a living tree, right? So I take it as a win-win situation. <laughs> or they say every uh, cloud has a silver lining, so this is the silver lining. Huh? So this one, there's no silver lining, because uh, sadly, this is not, uh, this is like a, it's usually a predator for the hornbills. So it predates on the eggs and all. Um, but this is actually a mistake. This is uh, earlier on, and we made the mistake of putting this box, resting this box on a branch. When you do things like that, it's easier for predators to reach the entrance of the box. Um, we had no choice with this tree because um, the way it was, uh, I mean, the, the weight of it and the type of tree. Because you can imagine this is a re regenerating forest. It's very hard to find a tree that's more than 20 meters high. So we don't have many choices where to put these boxes. So we've stopped putting boxes uh, on the branch, but we try to put it on the trunk of the tree whenever we can. So I've reached the end of my presentation. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and I want to thank all my funders and donors who stayed with us. And I mean, during this pandemic time, it's, it's been really tough, but we've had some, we've had a lot of help uh, from people all over the world. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, oh, the next slide is basically my, uh, the website details. Yeah, so if you want to know more, uh, you can go to the website, exploregaia.com. Um, I see 61 participants here, so I want to see 61 people uh, <laughs> follow us on Instagram and Facebook, if can la. Uh, and you can also email me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Ravinda. So now it's, uh, we are on to the Q&A session. So um, I'll hand over to Harris for the Q&A. Thanks. And then we will also be uh, sending the link now on the uh, quiz. So the quiz uh, will be sending out through the chat box. So look out for that. Uh, so while, while you're all doing the quiz or your children are doing the quiz, we will go to the Q&A session, OK? Just give me a second. Uh, Ravinda, maybe you want to talk about the prices? Oh, okay. I have, a, I have one year physical. So it's a coloring sheet uh, made by Marsha from Russia. It has all the eight species of hornbills for your coloring pleasure. We've not shared this uh, with anyone yet, so whoever who gets it will be the first one. Hold on, everyone. Okay, so yes. Share the photo, huh? Online. Yes, okay, we'll do. So the yeah, the, the quiz is um is already in the chat box. Kindly mm -hmm. go to the chat box and click on the link and we will announce the 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 top the first three that comes in with the the, the highest score. Okay, then um, Ravinda will, will post this uh, special edition uh, coloring poster of the eight species of hornbills of Borneo to you. Okay, so good luck. And um, let's take uh, the questions, please, Harris. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Ravinda. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting and informative talk on hornbills. So I'll go to the questions. We've got uh, some very you know, interesting questions by our participants. Okay. The first question comes from uh, Ken Wee. He's asking, do hornbills roost together? Uh, depends on species. So some species tend to roost together, like the bushy crested hornbills. They like to be together. Uh, I've seen uh, rhinoceros hornbills roosting uh, in pairs. So yeah. But they tend to choose the same side line. 
All right. Next will be from Michelle Yeo. She's asking, uh, do hornbills mate for life? How is their mating pattern like? Yeah, so they pair for life. Um, we've actually seen this uh, based on photographs. You see it's the same pair. You can recognize them from their cars and their build. So we recognize that this is indeed the same pair that comes back to the nest tree year after year. Are there any projects on uh, breeding certain species? Uh, would there be any effect on the ecosystem? Um, what do you mean? Like in reintroduction then into the wild? Uh, yes, that means we identify certain species which are maybe uh, depleting and we, we introduce, reintroduce them into the wild. Will that, will that, is that possible and what would the impact be in the ecosystem? Oh, I see. Um, you, before you do that, you need, I would say you need to find out if hunting is an issue in the area. Um, and also, is there, is there enough food for the hondels? So these are things that you need to find out first. It, like for example, our artificial nest boxes, we are comfortable putting them up in Kinabatangan because there's a lot of uh, activity, you know, uh, warden, wildlife wardens actively patrolling the area. There's no hunting really reported in the area. So therefore, we put up boxes. So if you want to do reintroduction, you have to check all these things first. Like, is there enough fruit trees? Is it safe for them, you know, in the area? But I think right now, we don't need to go to that, that level yet. Um, there are other things that we can do, like, provide them nesting opportunities. Uh, maybe have more orang aslis uh, doing nest adoption, nest guardianship projects. I think these are more important now. All right. Uh, our next question is, uh, it, the, the horns on the hornbill, do they carry any function? Besides, you mentioned just now, the stripes indicates their seniority for the yeah. other species. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it, it has something to do with audio for sound, amplifying sound. Uh, but like the cask of the helmeted hornbill is for head budding in midair. So it's more like a territorial display, especially when they're near a fig tree, they will head butt. Yeah. I see. So it's got multiple functions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, the the artificial boxes you made. Uh, what what material are they made of? Uh, is there any chance that it's we use uh, lighter materials? Uh, yeah. Uh, would it, that be? Yeah. The latest boxes are actually made from uh, plastic barrels. Uh, so okay. It's so cheap. it lasts forever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that means there there is opportunity to, to make it uh, simpler and easier. Yes, yes, definitely. Right. Because we want to be as low tech as possible, as cheap as possible, because we want more, more boxes uh, up if possible. Uh, there's one more question from Yuk Mui. Uh, does the hornbill make the entrance smaller if you choose the nest, like it does for natural cavities? Does it make that it means, that compared to artificial, artificial uh, boxes, to natural mm -hmm. cavities, would mm -hmm. they also uh, make the entrance smaller in the same case as uh, natural cavities? So you mean the ceiling? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the rhinoceros hornbill box that I showed, uh, it has a diamond shaped entrance. And that was actually uh, what was recommended by the Thailand hornbill project. And that seems to be a very successful uh, design. I think they like to see it. I see. So even if it's uh, artificial, they still do the sealing uh, activity, sealing process. Yeah. All right. Uh, any idea what is the current population of hornbills in uh, maybe in Sabah or in Malaysia? Difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we only go by um, presence and absence. Um, but what I've seen uh, in my six years in Kinabatangan, I see. Uh, I'm worried about the white crown hornbill, uh, helmeted hornbill. These are hornbills that I, I ra rarely see. Uh, I don't see reed hornbills in Kinabatangan, but that's okay because it's, it's a lowland forest. It's not really their area. They prefer highlands. But yeah, these two species I feel are, are going down quite drastically. Mm. So we should have more focus on these two species in particular, is what you mean? Yeah. yeah actually, in fact, uh, one of the things uh, I feel is artificial nest boxes need to be made uh, species specific. So you got each species has a different uh, preference. Uh, some like rounder cavities, some like protruding cavities, some like elongated cavities. They all have different uh, requirements. Are, are these by species or by individual uh, hornbills? Yeah, by the... species. 
these are studies that were done in Thailand and all that. They noticed that there's a preference by species. Yeah, by species, not, okay. Yeah, not individual. Right. Next question coming from Philip Ng is, uh, since the forest is scattered and surrounded by palm oils, how do we yeah. protect the forest? Yeah. It's already a protected area, actually. Uh, Kinabatangan Wildlife Sanctuary. It's a sanctuary. Uh, 2001, I think it was established. Yeah. So we uh, actually like NGOs like Hutan are working very closely with uh, the oil palm companies. They are working together to either um, connect, you know, all these uh, fragments of forest, trying to connect them back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is work ongoing on that. All right, so that, that is some uh, improvement activities going on. Yes, very much, especially in Kinabatan. Right, um, let's see, are there any more questions? How many species do we have? A total of eight species in Malaysia? Uh, ten, in Peninsula. ten in Peninsula, Malaysia, and eight in uh, Borneo. Ten and eight, okay. Mm. The hornbills in uh, Kinabatangan, do they stay within the area or they, uh, they, do they roam around across uh, cross other areas, other reserves? So we suspect that uh, because we've seen large flocks of rhinoceros hornbill, up to 50 plus coming to Kinabatangan. So we suspect that they're just coming to feed and then they move on to find other places to uh, nest in. Because you have Tabin Wildlife Reserve, you know, all these better forests nearby. So, so that means they do... Yeah, they come in April, then they disappear. Yeah. So there is some uh, migration going on there like, within mm -hmm. the state itself. Yeah, and also right. this could be like, young hornbills are the bachelor group. They haven't paired yet, so they flock together. What is the average lifespan of a hornbill? Uh, if there's any, any specific time that we, that we can see them active? Uh, mm, it depends on the hornbill. Uh, some hornbills in captivity like the rhinoceros hornbill and all that 30-40 years they can live. Uh, um, what was the second question again? Uh, the other one was uh, the lifespan of the hornbills. Ah, the lifespan is about 30 to 40, 30, 40 years. years yeah. and then, the best time to see them. Well, best time to see them. Um, um, I think in Kinabatangan, you can see hornbills throughout the year. Um, of course, when it's rainy season, it's more difficult. Uh, but generally, uh, Kinabatangan is one of the best places to see. At least seven species you can see. Wow, okay. So that means they are quite active throughout the whole year. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Quite, quite yeah. nice that place, yeah. Um, helmeted is very difficult to see. Mm -hmm. But the All other right. species, good chances. Okay, next question comes from uh, Sui Neo E. Uh, she mentions that there are hornbill feeding activities in Pangkor. So will this affect uh, the behavior of the hornbills perhaps in the long run? Hmm. I'm not sure what they are feeding it also. That's also quite concerning. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah um, the pites are very resilient. Um, in fact, we actually find that they are, they are harassing the nesting rhinoceros hornbills in the boxes. So I would be concerned that by feeding uh, oriental pites, you actually help their population and then that, that, that might be a problem for the other hornbills actually. Um, yeah, that might be an issue. All right, uh, next question. Uh, what if you use uh, glass to make the artificial boxes? I believe the idea is to see what's going on inside the box. Oh, to put a glass. Yeah. No. That means, that means the, the... No la. So I mean, may... you notice it during the pandemic, a lot of zoos were reporting a lot of birds. <laughs> a lot of... Uh... Yeah, so yeah. they need privacy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I uh, agree with you. Okay. So usually, actually, when a hunter is nesting, that's why, that's why my talk is called Watching Silently. Uh, we don't disturb, we, we build hides. The bird doesn't know we're there also. Because yeah. uh, the male might not come back to the nest. It's nest, so, yeah, okay. Yeah. They need their privacy, okay. Uh, usually we don't. We could put a camera inside, uh, but mm -hmm. that would be very costly. Uh. Mm. All right. Mm. Okay. Uh, has there been any impact of climate change on the hornbills from, from what you study? 
is there any impact uh, uh, that the, the change in climate, global warming, and so on? Does it in any way impact the lifespan or the behavior or the feeding pattern, perhaps, of the hornbills? I think it will affect the breeding season because um, in Kinabatang, it's actually supposed to be dry now. We're actually supposed to see all the hornbills growing into the cavities June, July, but it's not really happening because it's quite wet nowadays. It's raining almost every day. So this might be an impact from climate change. Uh, the weather is changing. So, and hornbills usually, they nest in the dry season and they come out during the wet season. Mm. Okay, so that means this, this has already have an impact on the hornbills yeah, this, on, this on, the, on their nesting pattern. Yeah, yeah this year we're seeing uh, lesser hornbills nesting. But it also could be because uh, last year they were nesting so usually hungers they nest every other year sometimes. Yeah. So, so alternate years? Uh, yeah. Like for helmeted hunger, they will nest alternate years. Because their chick I is see. with them. Mm. So last uh, year, yes, okay. we saw quite many of them go in in June. Do they have any natural predators uh, when they are nesting or when they are adult? Yeah, um, the monitor lizards predate on the eggs, uh, the yellow throated martin. Uh, praise on the chicks uh, in Thailand. There's reports of that. Um, yeah, snakes. Yeah. Okay, oh, um, yes, yes. I think uh, Danau Giang has had an incident with uh, sun bears. Ah, okay. Mm. Right. How long will the nesting period be? Um, how long from from from? Uh, ah, to end, uh. Uh, it depends yes. on the species again. So like helmeted hornbill and red knobbed hornbill are the two species that have the longest time. Uh, it's about six months, five to six months. But uh, for seems. smaller body hornbills like uh, oriental pike, short tail, uh, three to four months. Mm. So it varies according to species as well. Yeah. So what, in, uh, what uh, other conservation efforts that you think that uh, the public or uh, policy makers or uh, organizations can, can chip in to, to help with uh, your cause on the cause for increasing the population of uh, hornbills. So the, because of what's happening now with the pandemic, uh, funding is a big issue. So I would say if it's possible, if there are corporates out there who can partner with, you know, any NGO, local NGOs that do work with conservation. Um, and of course, partner long-term. Because only when you do long-term projects together, can you see a difference. So a lot of the funders usually fund only one, one year. I think that's very difficult to see anything happen. Yeah. All right, I think uh, we have come to the end. Uh, there are some questions we have not answered yet, but we will post them up in our FB. So ah. we will take up these questions in FB. Lah. Right, mm. so Budi, I'll pass back to you. Okay, thank you, Harris. Uh, a lot of questions and there's some more that's coming in, so we'll do that uh, through Facebook posting. All right, so now we come to the uh, moment. We look at the results of the quizzes, of the quiz. All right, so let me open up. Let me share the screen. Can you see that? <laughs> Can you see? Yeah. Okay, so basically the first one coming to is uh, uh, Michelle Yeo. There you go, I told you we have a superstar in the room. So Michelle Yeo, 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is uh, Karina. Karina Katikayan. Okay. Wow. Okay, and uh, the next person is Ng Yen Kam. Okay, so these are our three winners. So later on, uh, Ravinda will connect with you and get your address so that she can post out the um, the items to you. I think they're all in Malaysia, Ravinda. So no need to send to uh, overseas, I think. All right. So thank you very much to all the participants. We had um, 30... 33 people participated, well, it's actually 31 because I was doing testing. So two of mm -hmm. us were doing the testing. 
So we have 31 participants in, the, in this quiz. So thank you all for joining the quiz. So just to wrap up, it's uh, very interesting for me because uh, you know I've seen hornbills uh, from very far away, and um, it's the first time I've seen the um, uh, the videos, which is so clear and so near, and you can see the way that the birds uh, actually feed uh, the young. You know, so it's very interesting for us. So I hope it's also interesting for everybody and uh, specifically i think that the main takeaway message is that it is very difficult to try to uh, replicate nature in terms of trying to make the cavity and it's also very expensive and it is unnatural and uh, the best way is that going forward if we can try to raise the awareness of uh, of protecting the whatever forest we have and even uh, reforesting those areas that have been um, already been decimated okay so yes please uh, look into that in your areas and maybe even write into your uh, your representatives your member of parliament who's represent, representing your areas okay uh, so that that's the, the main takeaway we need to conserve what we have preserve what we have so that um, uh, nature itself will balance out and then we will have uh, still have a, a nice home for our kids and our grandkids all right so so that's it we've come to the end of the meeting uh, of this talk thank you Ravinder for joining us all right a lot of preparations and very very nice videos very nice photos and a lot of good sharing our okay. next thank you um, our next talk is on the um, on the 15th of uh, March we're looking at the horseshoe Sorry, 15 of August, August, sorry, 15 of August. And we have been looking, we'll be going to the sea. So from the forest to the sea, we are going to look at the horseshoe crabs, all right? So please join, in, join us then on the 15th of August, at uh, the same time, 2 p.m. So until then, thank you, Ravinda, for being our speaker of the day. And thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll catch up with you again. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Bye-bye.